Greetings and thank you uh, so very much to the Defeat MSA Alliance for inviting me to participate in their fifth annual virtual MSA conference. My name is Heather Hodges and I greet you from Denver, Colorado, where I work in a variety of roles as a speech language pathologist. My roles for LSBT Global include consultant, faculty, CEU administrator, and lead in an exciting research project um, in collaboration with University of Illinois as they strive to improve voice recognition programming for those with speech and voice disorders. I won't go into all of the details here on the slide regarding my bio, but I wanted to point out in addition to the roles and patients that I see with LSVT Global, I have 13 years experience working in a local outpatient hospital, seeing individuals for a variety of diagnoses, including swallowing disorder um, and Parkinsonisms, which are two of my main areas of passion. For today, our talking points are going to address um, feeding and swallowing. These are crucial for good nutrition, but also for protecting the airway uh, when we are swallowing during wakefulness and sleep. And so we'll discuss the what, why, and how of swallowing function, safety, and implications for uh, the health of those living with multiple system atrophy. We'll also be covering together today voice and speech therapy, specifically LSVT Loud for those with MSA, diagnostic and treatment planning alongside a speech language pathologist as part of your medical team, and general recommendations that I'll be giving to you to help ensure safe swallowing and to improve um, communication. The prevalence of swallowing disorders amongst the population of those with MSA, there's a big range in the research. Research It's between 31 to 78%. So this certainly is an important area of education and collaboration with your medical team. And we'll be starting with this topic first. So I list this because there are so many more aspects, so much more to swallowing than just the act of moving food through our throats. Swallowing actually begins with the process of getting food or liquid into our mouths. The process of getting uh, food and liquid into the mouth depends on good hand-eye, um, mouth, hand-to-mouth -mouth coordination, whole body posture, and all of that can also be addressed by our colleagues in occupational therapy if needed. Once the food is in the mouth, and depending on the consistency, it then has to be broken down into a form that can be easily moved to the back of the throat. And so this is where the biting, sipping, chewing phase, also known as the oral phase, occurs. This oral phase also includes the moving and pushing of that glob of food or liquid or secretions to the back of the mouth. And then the throat phase comes into play with squeezing of our food and liquid from the back of the mouth down into the esophagus by using structures of the muscles, uh, structures and muscles of the throat. During this time, when food and liquid is passing through the throat, Airway protection is vital when swallowing. The airway is actually closed off at two points during this throat phase. And then finally, what we swallow will enter the top of the esophagus, also located in the top or in the bottom, near the bottom of the throat. And then it concludes with the transit of the food and liquid down to the stomach and at that point when it enters the stomach the swallow is complete here's a nice picture demonstration of the phases of a food pictured here in green so maybe it's a piece of uh, broccoli or uh, spinach something like that and you can see it moving from the mouth in picture number one entering the throat and then into the esophagus in picture number three. 
take note that in the front of the throat is the airway. And then the back passage in the throat is the top of the esophagus. I'll draw your attention to picture number two and you'll see that the airway is actually closed off by a cartilage. Additionally, the vocal cords, which sit near the top of the airway, close as well. The airway stays closed until our food is in the esophagus and then we can safely breathe again. So talking about the motor impact on swallowing in MSA, when we consider the processes of MSA, the sensory changes, tremor, smaller movement, all of those can affect swallowing. But the two hallmark and more pervasive elements of MSA on swallowing are the aspects of bradykinesia, so slower movement, and rigidity. We see each manifesting to affect swallowing in patients with MSA, and these processes can affect any or all of the stages of swallowing. Knowing the base of swallowing impairments across the swallowing phases, let's talk about why is swallowing affected. And first, we will talk about the hallmark characteristic of bradykinesia. Bradykinesia refers to slower movement, and as we know in the fine-tuned sequence of swallowing, timing matters. And it matters for protecting the airway, allowing the airway to close in time and protect itself. It matters for keeping food and liquid in the mouth. It matters for coordination of all of these sequence of events to happen in an um, orderly and safe sequence. And it also matters for when the esophagus opens. The esophagus is actually shut until we swallow and it only opens to let food and liquid in and then it closes again. So slower movement can affect the timing of that esophagus opening. The other hallmark being rigidity, that affects range of motion and it affects the fluidity of motion. And this may greatly impact swallowing because range of motion matters for chewing, for, for forming that glob, also known as a bolus, for forming that glob into a nice manageable um, thing to swallow. Range of motion matters for keeping food and liquid in the mouth. Also, our voice box lifts up to close the airway. That's what flips that little flap that we saw in picture number two. Uh, that's what closes the airway. So our voice box has to be able to move efficiently and it also affects the uh, swallowing, the squeezing motion that's needed to let food pass through the mouth, the throat, and into the esophagus. Now there's really great news. The great news is there's intervention. And in MSA, intervention is possible, it's helpful, and it can be done early and regularly. So let's talk more about that. And in order to do so, I wanna talk about what a safe swallow is. A safe swallow is one where food and liquid stays in the mouth. When food and liquid moves, it doesn't get stuck behind. It's, it moves all the way through, it clears um, as the swallowing occurs. That food and liquid does not go down the wrong way into the airway. And that that food and liquid move through the esophagus without delay. Now, when there's a swallow disorder, you may hear your health professionals call this dysphagia or dysphagia. Um, they're pronounced both ways. And dysphagia just indicates a swallowing impairment. These impairments may include chewing, um, incomplete chewing. Uh, digestion actually starts with the act of chewing. It can, um, so it affects the breakdown of our food. It can also be where food and liquid are not held in the mouth and instead slip out or, or you see drooling occurring. Swallowing disorder may be because of food getting stuck going down or going down the wrong way and entering the airway or food or liquid getting stuck on the way down to the stomach. So down through the esophagus phase. 
And these swallowing impairments may involve any one process or a variety, a combination or all of the processes of swallowing. It really varies person to person. So how do you know if you have a swallowing issue? What are some of the signs and symptoms of swallowing changes? And then we'll also get into what can we do about it? So signs and symptoms of difficulty to be aware of um, as you're eating and drinking or if you're eating and drinking with um, a loved one or someone you're providing care for who has MSA, be on the lookout for choking when eating or drinking. Also, look for coughing or throat clearing after someone swallows. After they take that bite or sip, they swallow it down, do they <coughs> follow it with a cough or <coughs> A throat clear. If that happens, that's the vocal cords actually trying to move that item out of the airway. So coughing and clearing after a swallow is a big one to be on the lookout for. A wet voice quality. The vocal cords sit in the airway. So if liquid gets to them or sits on them to the point that it causes someone's voice to sound gurgly or wet, that means that liquid entered the airway while swallowing. If you notice having to swallow multiple times to get something to go down, to feel like it's really cleared out, that's another symptom. Food left over in your mouth, especially your cheeks in between um, your, the, your teeth and gums and the, the side of the cheek. So if you're getting food stuck in there, that should be addressed. Food or liquid coming out of the mouth, and an interesting sign to keep um, an eye open for is inexplicable chest congestion or chest infections. If you, you know, had a cold and you ended up with a bronchitis and you're coughing up a lot of mucus, that's, that's you know, explainable. But if out of nowhere you're feeling chest congestion, you're coughing up mucus, um, you get an infection without being sick first, those may be signs that food or liquid is aspirating and getting into the lungs and the lungs respond with mucus production and then an infection can easily set in. Why does this all matter? There's certainly repercussions for swallowing difficulty, including decreased joy from eating and drinking, under eating or malnutrition, increased, list, increased risk of lung infections, so that occurs when food or liquid enters the airway and is not coughed out. And there's two reasons why it might not be coughed out. For some, food and liquid enters the airway and their body stops sensing it. I see this happen with folks who are regularly aspirating. The body kind of stops sending up that warning sign or that reflex. And so they may be silently aspirating. Or for some people, they have a weak cough. It goes down the wrong way and then <laughs> their cough is not strong enough to fully eject that food or liquid out. If food or liquid enters into the airway, it can make its way to the lungs. And that's where, as I mentioned, you get increased chest congestion. And the biggest, scariest infection we can get is aspiration pneumonia. And aspiration pneumonia can be deadly. Aspiration pneumonia is also a type of pneumonia that you are not protected by from a pneumonia vaccine. Um, the reason for that infection has nothing to do with um, a virus or something that's catchy. It has to do with something, a foreign body entering into the airway. So we really want to avoid uh, that occurring, avoid that complication and decrease the risk um, of death from aspiration pneumonia. So how do we know if something's wrong with the swallow and how do we know which part of the swallow has a deficit and needs addressing? Well, speech language pathologists and other professionals use clinical tests and instruments since we can't see inside uh, the throat and mouth while we're chewing and swallowing. And so instruments are used to see inside the throat, the esophagus, the mouth, there's um, different tests that do this. One example of such an instrument is a modified barium swallow study, MBSS. This is a video fluoroscopic, which is just a fancy radiology way of saying it's an x-ray movie. 
that occurs while you eat and drink. So it's in real time. This exam is thought to be the gold standard test and it's frequently used and available at hospitals, radiology clinic, clinics, etc. There's also a camera test that uses a scope. This is called a FEES, F-E-E-S, and this will watch the oral and throat phases of swallowing. Both exams are completed while the patient eats and drinks various consistencies. And during that test, if they see something going wrong, they see a deficit, you may be asked during that exam to try different strategies while swallowing to determine individual tailored recommendations to optimize your safety and enjoyment while eating and drinking. Now, exercise, early intervention. This is key in helping keep uh, swallows safe and healthy. The intervention for a swallowing disorder does not stop at the exam. It does not end after that radiology exam or that scope exam. And this is because you can improve exercise is medicine, and we work to keep you safe while swallowing and maintain the joy of eating and drinking. So working with a speech language pathologist on swallowing is one of the key relationships, the key therapies um, that you can um, embark on in the rehab setting. A patient diagnosed with a swallowing disorder will need treatment intervention with um, a speech language pathology, pathologist, and this therapy may include any or all of the following. Exercises to strengthen, to address coordination of the structures while eating and drinking, to improve coordination of breathing during the swallow. And this type of treatment may also include increasing muscle strength for a more breathing muscle strength for a more efficient cough. Um, and better breath holding mid swallow, since that is one way that our airway closes during a swallow. Dietary considerations may also be included and would uh, potentially include calorie intake to maximize energy, viscosity, how fast food or liquid moves, water versus pudding, for example. Viscosity can matter for some folks. Sensory can matter. Um, so how flavorful, how cold, some of those um, strategies can actually improve sensory input and help with keeping a swallow being more timely, safe, faster moving, etc. And candidacy for free water in those individuals who do need to uh, perhaps go to a thickened liquid, uh, that sometimes is a recommendation for some folks. And in those folks, I would absolutely recommend talking to your physicians about this idea that research shows drinking plain unthickened water can be done in a safe way that does not increase risk of aspiration pneumonia and also has the benefit of keeping you hydrated. Now I have some tips for safe swallowing. These tips are general, they're not blanket statements because um, there's not a one size fits all when it comes to swallowing, but these recommendations can be given as good general safe swallowing tips so you can be proactive or perhaps to adopt prior to a swallow workup if one is in your near future or already scheduled and you're on a wait list, um, for example. This includes limiting distractions, thoroughly chewing, Get that, get that little glob that you're gonna swallow into a good form so it's not leaving bits of itself behind. For example, it's gonna go down easier. Swallow one bite before taking the next. So unlike growing up with my two older brothers who would shovel their food in at dinner time when they were teenagers, it really is you know, eating politely, but it's also safe. Take a bite, chew, 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 swallow, then take your next bite. Similarly, taking one sip at a time versus chug, 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 chug. That's safer for the airway, as well as your posture. So sitting straight, keeping your head neutral, so that's where swallowing in your head with this position versus, let's say you're at the end of a drink, 
You don't want to be swallowing with your head craned way back. That leaves your airway more open. So if you are at the end of a drink, take a sip, hold it, come down, and then swallow. Very cold or very flavorful food and drink, as I mentioned, can increase sensory input and kind of wake up the swallow. Getting into the habit of swallowing twice for each bite or sip. That way, if anything is left over any residue or drops of liquid left over in your throat, that extra swallow helps clear it. And swallowing is exercise. So doing a double swallow can inadvertently provide you a little extra workout. Take caution with straws. Some people will say no straws ever, but really for some folks, straws can be of a help. It can actually go down easier and safer through the throat for some people. For others, it's worse. And so it really is one of those, it's a help or a hindrance. It varies person to person. So if you notice using straws causes you to cough less, causes you to cough more, that will determine if you should drink some straws or not while you wait for your, your swallow study. Stay well hydrated. It's good for our whole body, but what helps with this area is we're less sticky. So you don't want a sticky tongue, you don't want a sticky throat, etc. It's gonna be more likely to leave things behind. And keep monitoring your symptoms. Now, what's interesting as we transition to thinking about MSA and how there is an influence of MSA on swallowing and voice. And so you definitely may see that there is um, a negative impact that MSA has had on voice, speech, communication. Why in the world swallowing and voice may be both affected is because with these two fundamental aspects of life, they both involve the same anatomy. They both require coordinated activity across respiratory, laryngeal, and oral systems. The symptoms we see in voice and speech with MSA, folks may be harder to understand, have a hoarse voice, soft speech, decreased loudness, changes in rate, Speech may become faster or slower. Breathy kind of voice that's happening. Monotone voice that's all one pitch. For uh, in MSA, we often see that the pitch can get higher than what it was before the diagnosis. Less fluent speech, which can include stuttering. Masked face is also listed here. While it's not something that's direct related to speech and voice, a masked face can affect communication in that the engagement of others is affected. If we have a masked face, people may think we're bored or not interested, and so they may not talk to us as much or for as long. So that impacts communication as well. Now, the treatment for voice and speech in MSA is called LSVT Loud. There are over 30 years of research, including research funded by the National Institutes of Health, that establishes LSVT Loud as an efficacious treatment for those with Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonisms, including MSA, and other non-PD diagnoses as well. The treatment protocol for LSVT Loud includes and really has the treatment target, the focus of loudness. Now with that, we're not teaching people to yell, but instead to think loud, to feel loud. And this allows them to produce a voice that's within normal limits, that's easy to understand and hear. So we target loudness to tackle bradykinesia, rigidity, hypokinesia. And this is a well-researched protocol where the mode is intensive. Exercise is medicine. So high number of repetitions, high effort, those are key to really improving the system. And LSVT Loud addresses the sensory issues with that, within MSA that causes patients to hear and feel their own voice as being loud enough when in fact it's very quiet, maybe even at a whisper. So we have to address this aspect in order to generalize this voice that we can achieve in the treatment room into their real world life. 
These are some studies that highlight the research beyond just establishing efficacy. Um, we see in the highlighted areas of this research that breath support, vocal cord closure, articulation, clarity, intonation, voice quality, even facial expression, that facial masking I was just talking about, all of these improve after treatment. It was a really unexpected spread of effects that we saw occurring when loudness was trained and achieved. And so to demonstrate this, I invite you to do a little experiment with me from the comfort of your own home or wherever you may be streaming. And so on the count of three in a regular voice, I want you to tell me, have a good day. One, two, three. Now what I want you to do is tell me to have a good day in a loud voice. You're really excited, you're um, fascinated, you're really engaged. Show that to me with a loud have a good day on the count of three. Did you notice what happened? Without even realizing it, you took a bigger breath. You opened your mouth more, your face was more expressive, your speech was crisper, and you excited your nervous system. Maybe now you even feel more awake having done this after sitting here and just listening to me for the past 20 minutes or so. And this is why we focus on one target, one thing for our patients with MSA to think about or to be reminded to do. This changes so much across the whole system, so it's efficient and more likely to be successful than if we instead had to change each part of our, of our voice individually. I would much rather just think about one thing, just think loud, than the laundry list of take a deep breath, open your mouth, move your lips and tongue more, articulate your speech, engage your facial expression. I couldn't sustain that laundry list in myself, nor in helping a loved one be cued to speak clearer that way. But thinking loud, thinking about one thing makes, about, uh, makes a much more successful communication much easier and much more feasible, easier to achieve. Now to increase strength, endurance, coordination, ease of speaking, it's intensive. It's four days a week for four weeks. There's homework, carryover, using this voice in their real world, practicing being cued at home if need be, and it's a workout. This schedule of intensity is research-based. Just like a medication, taking half the dose doesn't work, changing the intensity is gonna dilute it, so it really is an intensive exercise. And the best news is, is that it's fun and engaging. We see that those four weeks fly by because time flies when you're having fun. Within the calibration, we're using louder voice outside of the treatment room with other parts of this uh, beyond with the speech therapist. We take that strength and endurance that we've built up so that they can use that louder voice at home, in the community, etc. This will include, as needed, training of carers on ways to cue for louder voice from the patient. We train the carers so that their cues for loudness are done in ways to avoid frustration for the patient or the carer. It's easily implementable and we take this very small scaled down voice and speech um, and turn it into this image on the right. Tips for communication. Talk face to face, minimize background noise, um, and distractions, wait time. Give your, your person with MSA time to respond. So wait, don't try to answer for them. Being a, given a simple cue, hey, tell me loudly what you wanna eat. If needed, use a closed set of options, like yes, no questions. Are you hungry? Or multiple choices, if they say, yes, I'm hungry. All right, do you wanna eat pasta, a burrito, or yogurt, for example? And I recognize that beyond LSVT loud voice and speech, other therapies may be needed or maybe needed later, including cognition treatment, language treatment, use of an AAC device, um, oral motor exercising, breathing exercises, those may be needed. 
Now, quickly, I'll just share um, that there is a cross-system influence on voice treatment into swallowing. This is why some research has shown that after LSVT loud, we see improvements in some swallowing um, aspects, some symptoms. And so in voice treatment, vocal cords come together, swallowing treatment, those vocal cords close to protect the airway. Pitch changes in voice treatment, make the voice box raise, which also occurs when we close our airway, the voice box raises up. And both involve effort and coordination across breathing, use of mouth, tongue, lips, etc., and working out the throat muscles as well. There were two separate studies that recently came out um, from Korea and Japan. Cumulatively, they found that after LSVT loud, patients with MSA had improved vocal loudness, maximum phonation time, which is a good indicator of increased breath support, improved scores on swallowing exams, especially uh, the scores for the throat portion of the swallow, improved psychological perception of their voice when filling out um, perceptual forms um, post-treatment. Opening of the esophagus was improved and faster movement of food from the mouth to the throat. And this is another nice summary showing the positive influence of LSVT on swallowing. And it really just comes down to exercising the same anatomy for both functions. Voice and swallowing also share some of the same brain networks and sensory systems, so it's pretty cool. It is a very important note, and I can't say this enough or loud enough. LSVT is not a replacement for direct swallowing treatment at this time. Research is ongoing, but what we see is patients who have LSVT loud, they have swallowing therapy as needed. We see that those two things together really sum up and amount to equaling optimized coordination and strength. And that really is the basis of whole person treatment. This is a great example of that. Research is ongoing to further understand the relationship between voice and swallowing. Um, but at this time, I wouldn't say to replace one with the other. Instead, LSVT loud may be an added bonus and maybe also further motivation to continue exercising even after you've graduated from your LSVT treatment. So next steps within voice, speech, and swallowing. If you're noticing any changes or challenging in either realm, talk to your physician about writing orders. For the speech language pathologist with voice um, you and with swallowing, you want a specialist because these are two areas of speech pathology that not all SLPs do. Um, just like doctors have specialties, speech pathologists have specialties. So you'll want to have a specialist who is certified in LSVT loud, who also um, it works with swallowing and treatment of swallowing. When getting that order for LSVT loud from your physician, you'll want an evaluation and 16 treatment sessions. If you're having symptoms of swallowing dysfunction or those unexplained chest congestion or infections, get a physician order for swallowing. I recommend the modified variant swallow study because it's the gold standard for really finding what specific challenges and impairments are occurring in each individual. They also provide um, at the end actionable, appropriate, feasible compensatory strategies and the safest diet. And these personal recommendations are necessary because not all swallows are the same. You could have two people with the same diagnosis, MSA, same age, same symptoms, and their swallow exams can look vastly different. So the recommendations are tailored. And so in summary, the etiology of voice and swallowing disorders is multifaceted. Brady kinesia and rigidity are the drivers in disordered swallowing and voice and speech in MSA. There's common underlying physiology impacts from MSA on voice and swallowing, and there's preliminary research that suggests a potential for cross-system interaction between voice and swallowing and that they can positively influence each other. Individualized diagnostics and treatment are key. LSVT loud won't replace swallowing therapy, 
but it might be a nice adjunct. It might be a nice bonus. Prioritize treatment as indicated. If you need to address swallowing before having LSVT loud as your voice treatment or vice versa, that's going to vary person to person and your speech language pathologist will help direct you. Occupational therapy may help with addressing feeding, getting food and liquid to the mouth. And other aspects of communication and cognition may need additional and other treatment approaches. And we can help you find certified clinicians in your area by contacting our main office at LSVT Global. I have listed here the email address, the website, our toll free number. And I want to wholeheartedly thank Defeat MSA Alliance for the opportunity to be here. And if you should have any questions, we can also help. You can reach out to us at any of these means listed with follow-up questions. And I thank you so very much for attending today. Enjoy the rest of the conference.